Chapter 21 Concluding Reflections It seems unnecessary to increase the volume of this book if the successful treatment of very many thousands of cases of a large variety of diseases including a liberal percentage of so-called incurable ones does not prove the efficacy of urine therapy then nothing else can Moreover, as we have seen, many of the patients had previously tried other methods, both orthodox and unorthodox, without success. This is not to say that the therapy can, without exception, cure every patient of every diseased condition. Severe arthritic conditions have proved very difficult to cure, whilst diabetic conditions have, in many cases, not yet yielded to the treatment at all. On the other hand, which may seem strains, growths and tumors said to be cancerous, as also cataracts have yielded quickly. As for those patients who might have been saved by urine therapy, they probably run into large figures. These are chiefly cases I had to decline to help, not because I regarded them as hopeless in themselves, but because I feared the interference of well-meaning but timid relatives at a vital moment when such interference might well have proved fatal. and they and i should have been faced with an inquest in short i was taking no chances for only qualified doctors can do this without risk to themselves in other words doctors are allowed to experiment on their patients either with drugs or with the knife and if the patients die so must the worse for their relatives whilst the doctor is credited with having done his best with a hopeless case One may perhaps argue that a layman who has found an efficacious cure for diseases should qualify himself to be an orthodox doctor at least in name if not in fact. But how can a man with any pretensions to uprightness bring himself to study a system of medicine in which he does not believe and which he regards as a menace to health? And for what? Merely that he should be able to diagnose a given number of diseases and call them by polysyllabic names? And supposing as with urine therapy the name of the disease has nothing to do with the selection of the treatment what then indeed the necessity of a correct diagnosis before a line of treatment can be decided upon is one of the drawbacks and limitations of allopathy for example if a woman has a growth in her breast the first thing a doctor wants to determine is whether it is malignant or benign but with urine therapy such a question is of the least importance since as we have witnessed the treatment for all diseases is virtually the same procedure saying that in the patient lies the magic fluid to cure his or her ills and the only prerequisite is to refrain from food like the animals so as to give nature her chance to do the work and she will do it her own way provided she is not interfered with This I have observed again and again with regard to the movement of the bowels during a urine fast plus cold water. Whereas the orthodox naturopath thinks it is necessary to assist the bowels with enemata during a fast on cold water alone or on fruit juices, a mistaken policy, on no account should such methods be resorted to during a urine fast, for nature must be left to determine when the bowels shall move. What we have to remember is that in fasting, urine taken via the mouth heals rebuilds and reconditions the vital organs including the intestines and while this process is taking place often bowels seem as it were to go to sleep and relapse into a state of inactivity which in severe cases may even last as long as 19 days yet this inactivity is an advantage especially to sufferers from hemorrhoids as it gives the latter a chance to heal thus nature it left alone does her work in her own way if we only have the faith to trust her even though at first we may not understand her mysteries verily nature's ways are not our ways and she defies and contradicts every superstition and orthodox tenet practice and belief urine therapy some practical suggestions by john w armstrong in one of the american states a law still exists making it illegal for a husband to kiss his wife on a sunday Of course no one pays the slightest attention because the law is not and cannot be enforced because it only involves the party concerned but it is a very different matter with laws involving huge commercial interests a kiss is not a manufacturable commodity serums and radium plants are and that is the trouble to the pure in heart which means the unselfish altruistic and uncommercially minded it seems doubtless a curious irony that the treatment of certain said to be incurable diseases has become illegal except at the hands of those who cannot cure them this is ostensibly to protect the public under courts 
yet the logician may ask to protect the public from what or from whom we presume from such persons as fraudulently profess to cure what they know perfectly well that they are unable to cure and who merely trade on the innocence and ignorance of the unwary well such a law has its advantages but it also has its drawbacks besides it would be more convincing if the usual measures adopted by the medical profession who agitated so that the law should be passed were one instrumental in saving the lives of those it professed to protect and two if those measures were not of so highly a lucrative nature operations for cancer are more costly to the patient than a few relatively harmless herbs sold by the quacks some of which have been known to do good and a radium plant is a costly affair for the purchasers and the very profitable to its vendors as also is radium itself many doctors as we have seen of both the allopathic and homeopathic schools have warned their confreres of the unsatisfactory results obtained both by surgery and radium but without any appreciable effect for the radium or operative treatment is still boosted as correct treatment for malignancy all the same doctors sometimes find themselves in a quandary and have been known to turn to the unorthodox when it is a question of saving a relative dr w h roberts the homeopath wrote that an allopathic surgeon in the ramc once called to see him about his sister is 47 who was suffering from a breast tumor for which she could not be treated as advised by a leading dublin surgeon owing to the fact that she was suffering from her disease dr roberts caller added i know nothing about homeopathy but you are at liberty to try your remedies the final option was that dr r cured the lady there was no recurrence and she lived for 17 years and finally died of some illness of influenza type c health through homeopathy july 1944 Homeopathic literature relates of many cures of cancer some more speedy than others and whether one agrees with homeopathic methods or not at least the patient avoids the risk of having to suffer the after effects so often associated with radium treatment surgery or both fortunately however some doctors are now discouraged and depressed by the transient and painful results of these treatments that they are willing to try other methods in interest of their patients and it is just to see these doctors that i addressed myself as well as to sufferers who i have every good reason to believe could greatly benefit by the treatment described in this book after all things have not come to quite such a pass though i shall have something to say about medical autocracy in my final chapter that a qualified doctor is forced by law to employ the precise treatment of the medical powers may advertise as the best nor can the law compel the citizen to be operated upon or be burned with radium against his will but as dr bedo bailey and other physicians of varied schools have pointed out how can members of the public demand a different form of treatment unless they know that such treatment exist when the medical profession advocates and boosts certain measures as at one time it advocated bleeding for every imaginable disease little mention is made of the many failures and often fatal results and it is only when the public finally gets to hear of this through the bitter experiences of the victims that a demand is made for something better sometimes a doctor will admit the superiority of a treatment but abstain from using it as witness the confession of a certain doctor relative to biochemistry of which in a coroner's court he said biochemistry is the most logical and up to date method of treating disease but we doctors are exceedingly conservative and we shall stick to the old way until compelled by circumstances obviously meaning the demands of the public to adopt the newer and better systems of medication quoted by J.T. Hesselton in Heal Thyself, July 1937. In view of all this, we are constrained to ask the questions mooted by C. Fraser McKenzie, C.I.E., viz. Is the medical profession for the welfare of the nation, or are the citizens for the benefit of the doctors? The answer, he goes on to say, is in favor of the nation, provided doctors are generously treated. Quite so. and i for one am the last to wish that doctors should not be fairly treated even though i was compelled to cure myself with my own methods in the end but as matters stand at the present it nonetheless looks very much as if the patients existed for the benefit of the doctors indeed it would hardly do to ask how many patients have died while physicians have been preoccupied with medical etiquette 
However, the need not detain us. The question is how to deal with the problem which confronts the sufferer who has ceased to believe in orthodox methods and is prepared to try urine therapy. Should he dispense with doctor's services or should he not? From nearly every point of view I consider, it would be better if he did not dispense with the services of his medical advisor. There is no practical reason whatever why the discovery or rather rediscovery of urine therapy should deprive the doctor of his bread, though that is a matter which rests entirely with the individual doctor. This book places him in a possession of the facts, and should he refuse when requested by a patient to supervise a urine fast, then I can hardly be blamed for what is not my fault. It will not be the first time that a patient has suggested to his physician the particular treatment he wishes to try, and if spectacularly beneficial results accrue therefrom, then all the better for the doctor's reputation. Moreover, a doctor can act as a buffer between the well-intentioned but obstructive and the tiresome interferences of anxious but often quite prejudiced and ignorant relatives who not only fear the worst but fear the formalities and publicity of an inquest as well. All the same, I must sound a note of warning. If a doctor thinks he can combine drugs with a urine fast, despite my affirmations to the contrary, the result will be failure. As we have seen, urine therapy is nature cure in the most literal sense of the word, and to employ measures which are contrary to nature at the same time would not only be quite illogical, but even dangerous. I know this to my cost, not as the result of this interfering with nature myself, but as the result of others doing so when my back was turned. Therefore, I give this warning and sincerely hope it may be heeded, provided it's heeded. I again repeat that the supervision of a doctor is desirable from many points of view, nor need the doctor feel any conjunction with the matter, nor any slight to his dignity, merely because his, this form of therapy was the outcome of a layman's experiments. Any physician who knows his medical history, who also knows that laymen have contributed much to the faculty of medicine, even the adulated pastor who did more to commercialize medicine than any other man was not a doctor, but merely a chemist. I may also mention hydropathy and the fact that doctors do not necessarily consider it infra dig to be associated with the hydropathic establishments. This being the case, I am optimistic enough to think that in the not too distant future there may be establishments where patients can be treated with urine therapy and where there will be a staff of nurses to look after them and do the urine rubbing. Why should people be destined to die of gangrene and others said to be in curable conditions when it is possible to save them? Although urine therapy can never be unfavorable to the employment of labor, any more than hydropathy has been in the past. There is also sanitation which, as R. Wireland points out, was introduced by laymen in the teeth of the passionate hostility of the medical profession with which thought its interest threatened. Yet, certainly sanitation has not been hostile to labor, and doctors themselves are now as much in favor of proper hygiene as at one time they were against it. As a matter of fact, all forms and changes threaten someone's interests, but in the end, matters adjust themselves. Yet, when all is said, is it right that vested interests should interfere with the physical well-being of the people? If I could honestly say that the various money-making gadgets that are now on the market were really means to lasting health instead of being just palliatives, often deceptive ones at that, I should be the last not to extol them. Nay, what interest have I in decrying them, seeing I have nothing to sell? The great advantage of urine therapy is the very fact that it costs nothing and can be used by poor and rich alike. The last number of impecunious people are now treating themselves with urine therapy in their own homes with the kind of assistance of relatives to do the rubbing and treatment does not cost them a penny. On the other hand, as I have implied, clinics in which urine therapy could be practiced and where it could be supervised by doctors would be of great convenience to those who could afford to attend such institutions.